So now we want to look at table 1.3, rootless jitters. So they are not connected with loba, dosa and moha, or a loba, a dosa and a moha. They have no roots. They generate kama. Kusala generates wholesome kama. Akusala generates unwholesome kama. So we have these two terms, kusala, akusala. Wholesome, unwholesome. These are actions which we perform which result in something and the result is called the vipaka. So we have kusala, akusala, generating kama, and vipaka, which is the result of kama. The chittas in table 1.3 are, for the first 15, all resultants. They are vipaka. They're called unwholesome resultants. That does not mean they are in themselves unwholesome, because they are vipaka. But they are the result of an unwholesome action. So it's not the, the chitta you see here, which is unwholesome. It was the previous action, the prior action, was akusala, resulting in these first seven uh, resultants. The feeling accompanying, or the sensation accompanying them, for the first four, is equanimity or indifference. If you still have your chart of the 17 thought moments, you will see we had at thought moment number five, five kinds of chitta connected with the senses. So there was eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, and tongue consciousness. When the appropriate sense door, like the eye, comes into contact with a suitable object, this causes eye consciousness to arise. So in the process of these 17 thought moments, there is one moment, number five, which is called either eye, ear, nose, or tongue consciousness, depending upon which sense door was stimulated by coming into contact with the object. There is another um, chitta as well, which is the body consciousness. This is different in that it causes some unpleasant or painful sensation. So if this object is some kind of unpleasant object which touches the body door, then pain arises. Still looking at your 17 thought moments, there was, or there is, the receiving consciousness, some partitioner, followed by the investigating consciousness, Santirana. So all of these first seven kinds of chitta are the result of some kind of unwholesome action and they play their part in the process of 17 
thought moments. So if we look now at numbers 8 up to 15, these are now um, a mirror image, at least as far as number 14. They're a mirror image of numbers 1 to 7 in that these are wholesome resultants, the result of some wholesome prior action. And again, we have the feeling or sensation of equanimity in the case of eye, ear, nose, and tongue. Body <laughs> has now changed from a feeling of pain to one of pleasure. So these are the same eye consciousness, ear, nose, tongue, and body consciousness, but they are now the result of a wholesome, not an unwholesome action. The Buddha made a distinction between physical pain and mental pain. Physical pain, everybody experiences, including arahants. We respond to the physical pain with mental pain, with aversion. You put your finger on a hot surface and you say, ow, and there's the aversion in the mind. The arahant will note the physical pain, but will not build onto it the uh, aversion in the mind that comes usually in the case of unenlightened beings. When the Buddha, for example, um, had his ankle injured by Devadatta throwing a rock down here trying to kill him, he felt the physical pain. When Angulimala came back from his arms round, having been beaten and stoned by angry people, he would have felt the physical pain. But there was no mental pain, no aversion, which is how most people would react. Yes, yeah, so we have, as far as number uh, eight, to 12 is concerned, they are paralleled by the first part of numbers 1 up to uh, th uh, 1 up to 5. Yeah, 1 to 5. And then again we have a receiving consciousness which is the same as the other receiving consciousness, number uh, six, <clears throat> except this is a wholesome resultant, not an unwholesome. <clears throat> but now, whereas in the case of number seven, the investigating consciousness, the Santirana, was only of one kind, now there are two possibilities. If it is a resultant from a wholesome uh, action, the feeling or the sensation can be either one of joy, that's number 14, or equanimity or indifference, that's number 15. And if we go on now to numbers 16 and 17, we have um, on the thought moments, thought moment number four, which is the adverting consciousness. This is turning the mind towards the sense door which has been stimulated. So we have, it says five door adverting. That can be either uh, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, or if it's something that's arising in the mind, in the mind door, then it's a mind door, adverting. So they are also to be found on the 17 thought moments. 
Now, I said that all this first part of the process of cognition, everything is, is a resultant, but there's one exception, and that's this. They are not resultants, they are called functional. The word is kriya. That means they are neither causing kama nor the result of kama. Purely functional. This is the only thought moment that we share with arahants. Arahants are not generating kama. All of their thoughts are kriya. From the time the Buddha became enlightened at the age of 35, he would have produced no more kama. So what arose in his mind were kriya, not creating more kama. Why can't you have, um, on the functional, why can't you have a, a pain version on the pain? You can have joy. No, we haven't got to summer 18 yet. You can only have, in 16 and 17, you can only have an indifferent feeling. Because the thought moment that turns towards the sense door that's not going to be either painful or pleasurable. It's just a functional. It's performing a function of directing attention towards one specific sense door. Okay? So that's that. They produce a Kriya thought moment, which is neither the result nor the cause of Kama. It is purely functional. It doesn't generate any more Kama. We go through our lives constantly creating fresh Kama. The Arahant doesn't do that. The Arahant will have to still receive the Vipakas, the results of previous actions. But he doesn't generate any more Kama. So the fact that the Buddha's ankle got injured, he said, was a Vipaka. He had been in a dispute concerning, I think, uh, an inheritance with members of his family in a previous life. So he had to receive the result of that injury to his ankle. But whereas you and me, we would then react with aversion, the Buddha could simply observe with equanimity. And so that is a Kriya action. It doesn't produce any more karma. And then we have number 18, slightly curious, a smile producing chitta. This is found only in arahants. And it is with reference to Many, all the phenomena in the sense sphere, which we might react to with uh, desire, because we like it, but the arahant does not generate feelings of attachment and desire. He just smiles. So this is called Hasitupada. This is found only 
in the mind of the Arahant. Now, yes? This unwholesome, wholesome, it's a bit of a misnomer, isn't it? That, uh, that we are, the object is to get away from both of these. Oh, no. I'm sorry, you're right, it is a bit of a misnomer. Because it, it, what I'm trying to make clear is that these resultants are not unwholesome or wholesome. They are the results of an action previously which was wholesome or unwholesome. So it's the previous action which is classified as either kusala or akusala. But the resultant, the vipaka, doesn't get divided into either wholesome or unwholesome. Right. Now, in case you're thinking perhaps you are beginning to understand all this, <laughs> the top says consciousness, chitta. I previously told you chitta can be subdivided into 89 kinds. So, the first level of subdivision is the plane. And we have consciousness of the plane of sense desire. Or karma vachara chitta. Then consciousness of the plane of form Rupa Vachara Chitta, consciousness of the formless realm or plane, Arupa Vachara Chitta. If you go back to your 31 planes of existence, or you go back to the chart 1.8, you will find Chitta there is also subdivided into sense sphere or sense desire, form sphere, and then form left. Here. If you go down now onto the, the first subdivision, the consciousness of the plane of sense desire, you will see that is divided into Akusala or bad, um, Ahetuka or rootless, and then sobana, or beautiful. If we take just the first one, the akusala, the bad, you will see that was subdivided here into the root of greed, the root of hatred, and the root of delusion. That corresponds with your table 1.2. Because you can see we have chitras rooted in greed, rooted in hatred, and rooted in delusion. There were Eight rooted in greed, two rooted in hatred, and two rooted in delusion. And if you look down the bottom of that column, you see it says table 1.2. So this big chart is a picture of the overall scheme of things. And you can fit table 1.2 into this column here. OK.
Okay, so now we can turn to table 1.4. These are called beautiful. And these produce good qualities. They are accompanied by wholesome roots like generosity and loving kindness and knowledge or understanding. And you can see that they are classified, first of all, by the the feeling or the sensation, which can be either joyful or one of equanimity or indifference. This is not true equanimity, not, not the truly developed high level of balance in the mind. And we can call it a neutral feeling. Associated with knowledge or dissociated from knowledge. Knowledge is wisdom. And these chitters either are associated with wisdom or not associated with wisdom. It doesn't mean to say there is ignorance, it's just not associated with wisdom. And again, we have prompted and not prompted. And there are now eight kinds of these chittas. And if you look on the right hand side of the page, you will see the words wholesome, resultant, and functional. The wholesome kinds of chitta are where we create kama. These are all called beautiful chittas. They're wholesome chittas. There's no unwholesome here. So you can say that someone, number one, would be some, someone with a feeling of joy with knowledge or understanding that he is doing a wholesome action, performs maybe an act of generosity. And he does it not prompted. He does it spontaneously. He does it without any forethought or premeditation. He spontaneously performs an act of generosity. He feels happy to do it, and he understands what he's doing. Number two is exactly the same, except there is prompting. Either he premeditates it in his own mind, or somebody else suggests it to him, tells him, go ahead, do this. Number three is like number one, except there is no understanding that he is performing a wholesome deed. 
An example of that would be a child joyfully pays respect to a monk. He doesn't know why he does this. He's got no understanding, just copying his parent. So in that case, he feels happy to do it, but he doesn't really understand why he's doing it, but he does it spontaneously, without having to be told to do it. He just copies his parent. Yes, but they would not understand in the Buddhist sense what they're doing. They may still perform an act of generosity, but they would not have the Buddhist understanding. Because the intention is not there. Well, the intention is to give, but they do not understand the Buddhist teachings about Kama and Vipaka, about uh, dana, whole, this whole huge area of Buddhist culture concerning dana, acts of giving. This is a hugely important and very detailed area of Buddhist practice. I think the intention is there, but um, the difference is that intention based on what you so it could be single. Well, Could not only in normal intention, just being as a doing it as a good person here that does it, but doing it in accordance to learnings and the needs of Buddhism. Well, I think one of the characteristics which distinguishes dharma from other acts of generosity is that it is done without any expectation of gratitude, reward, reputation, anything like that. Pure dharma is giving for the sake of giving without any attachment. In fact, the practice is designed to help us break attachment. Yes, but, 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 but for, the sake, for the purposes of classification here, we have to make the distinction between where there is understanding and where there is not understanding. Every kind of chitta has to be able to be fitted somewhere into this chart of 89. So if it's not going to go into this particular slot, it's got to go into that one. If it's not going there, it's got to go there. There's got to be a pigeonhole for every single kind of chitta. Yes. These are rooted in wholesome roots. They will all have um, non-greed and non-hatred. They may have non-delusion when it is associated with knowledge. But when it is dissociated from knowledge, there may still be some form of delusion or wrong understanding. So if you look now on your big, big chart, you'll see we've had table 1.2, 1.3, and 1.4. That deals with the karma vachara, the the sense sphere planes. We're going to go up a level to table 
This is fine material sphere jitters. If you have your chart of 31 planes of existence, these are shown as fine material. That is numbers uh, 16 to 28. I think so 1.5, we are now moving into a new, <clears throat> a new plane, a new area. We have lost our contact with the sense sphere, and this is called the fine material sphere. All of these chitters from now on are wholesome. They all have good roots, the roots of our loba, our dosa, and our moha. The, in the lower um, planes, in the in the karma, in the sense sphere, the mind is always chasing around after different sensory objects which are continually bombarding our sense doors. We're always hearing, seeing, tasting, touching, feeling what we hope are pleasant sensations. Here, the attachment to the senses is weakened. In fact, the sense bases of eye and ear are still present, but smell and taste and touch are no longer present. These are much more subtle planes of existence. To attain these planes, it is necessary to practice a form of meditation using a fine material object. That's why these are called fine material sphere. Usually, not always, but usually the material object can be what are called uh, a casina, um, or a disc, which may be coloured and is used to concentrate. You can also use the breathing and various other objects on which to concentrate. And if the concentration is deepened by assiduous practice, holding the attention on the object, the mind becomes purified temporarily of certain um, hindrances and it develops certain positive qualities, which are called jhanic factors. And this results in the attainment of states that are called jhana. I'll go into greater detail about jhanas next week, but we're just trying to fill in all the picture of the 89 kinds. And you will see, I think on your big chart, that starting at number 55, table 1.5, we have um, first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, and fifth jhana. 
for the first jhana to arise, it has to be accompanied by five factors. These are called initial application and then sustained application. The initial application is when the mind is first applied to the object. Then this has to be sustained by further effort. One analogy is um, a bee landing on a flower. That is the initial contact with the flower. Now he starts to explore the flower. Where exactly is this nectar that he wants? So that is the sustained activity. So you have the initial application and then you have the sustained application. This is accompanied by a quality here called zest or joy, piti, P-I-T-I. Piti is a very happy state of mind quite an excited state of mind in which the mind is filled with joy. Some people who wrongly criticize Buddhism as being too negative, too pessimistic, going on the whole time about dukkha and pain and suffering, blah 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 blah, they forget that one of the important factors here is and that leads on to a state of happiness. Happiness is a bit calmer than zest. And then from there, or in addition, the mind becomes concentrated on one point or one object. So when all these five factors are present, we can call that the first jhanic state. <laughs> the happiness, um, no, the, uh, sorry, the one point in this is ekagata. The zest is piti, the happiness is indeed sukha. Now, if the meditator continues this practice, as he sustains the practice, it is not necessary any longer <laughs> to have the initial application. So the initial application drops away. <laughs> this means we have now attained the second jhana. There is still a sustained application, zest, happiness, and one-pointedness. Further continuation of the practice means that the sustained application is no longer necessary. So now we have just zest, happiness, and one-pointedness. That is the third state of jhana. The fourth state is where there is just happiness and one-pointedness. And the fifth state, the happiness, is now replaced 
with equanimity. And this is not the same equanimity that we encountered when we were looking at the chittas arising on table 1.2, 1.3. This is a highly developed state of poise in the mind, whereby it is able to keep a balanced state of mind, not veering towards any kind of attachment or any kind of aversion. It is a very pure state of mind accompanied with one pointedness. There are two ways of classifying jhanas. In the Abhidhamma, we have five jhanas. In the suttas, it speaks of only four jhanas. The difference being that when the second jhana is attained, not only the initial application, but also the sustained application drop away. So now you need only four stages of jhana, not five. So you can place your money, you take your choice, whether you want to follow the suttas or follow the Abhidhamma. Um, is it correct to say that uh, <coughs> right concentration, the eight noble, uh, uh, you know, the eight factor in the noble eightfold path, is it correct to say that the uh, four jhanas are the, uh, I mean, when you say right concentration, is it the four jhanas? Well, right concentration is absolutely necessary for the jhanas to uh, arise. Are they kind of, uh, if you have the four jhanas, does that mean you have right concentration as well? In yes. The eightfold path? Yes, you have to. Now, just as we had with table 1.4, <clears throat> on the right-hand side of the chart, we have three columns, wholesome, resultant, and functional. Here, too, we have wholesome. These are states of, <clears throat> of chitta attained by people who may be living in this plane, the human plane, but who attain these states by this meditation practice. That's numbers 55 to 59. And this applies not only to, to worldly people living in this world, but also to the first three stages of sainthood. When we looked at the ten fetters, there were the four stages of sainthood. The stream enterer, once returner, and non-returner. All these individuals can develop states of jhana, which will be classified as numbers 55 to 59. Then we have resultants. This is arising in beings who have been born in these jhanic states <clears throat> as a result of previous wholesome action. So their chittas are resultants. That's number 60 to 64. And then we have the arahants whose chittas are purely functional or kriya. So that's number 65 to 69. So if you look at your big, big, big chart, you should find 
table 1.5 shown under the fine material planes, the Rupa Vachula. Everybody got that or not? We gave up more 1.5 a moment ago, didn't we? I haven't got any more 1.5s at the moment. You can photocopy for you afterwards. But you should find it on your big chart. You've got 1.5 there. That's the important thing. So that's table 1.5. Now take a look please at 1.6. Uh, if you look on your chart of 31 31 planes of existence, you will see that the highest four are called formless. Here, all forms of matter have been transcended, and there is only the consciousness, the chitta and mental factors, Chaitasika. And this, these uh, states can be attained by people living in the world like us, <clears throat> performing a higher level of meditation practice. And these result in what are called the immaterial sphere jittas, of which there are four. Again, they can be attained by people living in the human plane and also by the stream enterers, once returners, and non returners. And in the case of the first one, the base of infinite space, <clears throat> the meditator who was doing meditation in the lower forms of jhana, the fine material jhanas, whatever material object <clears throat> he had, as his object of meditation, he removes that object out of the mind. And a point of light may appear, which he can then expand to an infinite degree. Hence, we get the <coughs> concept of space being infinite. So this is the first Arupa jhana, first formless jhana, infinite space. Then he contemplates that the consciousness which is aware of the infinite space must itself also be infinite. So now we have the base of infinite consciousness. Then 
then by emptying the chitta <coughs> of even the concept of infinite space, we reach the state of infinite, or sorry, base of nothingness. The base of um, void. And lastly, the even more subtle state of jhana is the base of neither perception nor non-perception. This is now a state in which the, the citta has become so subtle, so pure, we cannot say if there is perception taking place or if there is no perception taking place. State of neither perception nor non perception. This is the highest attainment available to people living in the world. If you remember, or if you don't remember, um, when Prince Siddhartha left the palace at the age of 29, he went to find out meditation teacher. The first meditation teacher that he met with was called Alara Kalama. And Alara Kalama taught the attainment of this base of nothingness. And Siddhartha abandoned Alaraka Lama. For what reason? Why did he not stay with Alaraka Lama? Right. The, the attainment of this high, high, high level of jhana was very pleasant was not permanent. And Siddhartha is looking for permanent happiness, not temporary happiness. So that's when he went off and then he met up with Uddhika Ramaputta. And that teaching resulted in the attainment of neither perception nor non-perception. And again, what did he do? left him for the same reason. This attainment, very pleasant, very enjoyable, but not permanent. And that's when he struck off independently and, as we know, uh, attained eventually the um, state of enlightenment. So you should find Again, on the right-hand side of the, of the chart, um, the columns of wholesome, resultant, and functional. 70 to 73 are wholesome. That's attained by either worldly people or by those who are in the first three stages of sainthood. Beings who have been reborn in these high states can experience the same chittas as resultants. That's 74 to 77. And in the case of Arahants, they're purely functional. 78 to 81. So now you should be able to slot table 1.6 into your big chart. Then, very quickly, I think last week or the week before, 
I gave out table 1.7 which has four stages, the stream entry, once returner, non-returner, and the arahant. And they have two kinds. Of chitta, we've now gone beyond wholesome and resultants. We've got to what is called path and fruit. The path consciousness arises for only one moment. Its function is to clear away certain obstructions, certain fetters, which are obscuring the mind. That is its job. One thought moment only of path, called Magga. And then, after that, you get the fruit of the Palla, which is the state of mind in which the mind has been purified of certain unwholesome qualities which are associated with the attainment of stream entry, once returning and non-returning. That uh, fruition consciousness can go on and on and on without limit until the next attainment is achieved. So the stream enterer becomes a once returner by um, number 83, the path consciousness arising, clearing away obstructions, and then continuing as the fruition until again the next state is attained and so forth. And if you look at the bottom of the chart, right hand column, we have got to number 89. So all of these various chitters, all these different tables, 1.2 up to 1.7, are fitted into the big chart, which gives you hopefully the overall picture. That's a good question. There are different points of view. The general opinion is that you have to attain the um, fine material sphere jhana. What was the first jhana? Using a fine material object. You do not have to attain the <clears throat> formless jhanas, the highest numbers, uh, 28, 29, 30, 31. They are a kind of optional extra. So there we are. We've done up to number 89. I'll say a little bit more next week about the various jhanas and their uh, um, attainments. Thank you, Richard. You're very welcome. Thank you for coming. <laughs>